Hi, Jim. Thanks very much for joining us here on the Green Age. Just a bit of background for you first. The Green Age is a website in the UK aimed at helping homeowners and small businesses. We want them to become more aware about energy efficiency and various electricity generation methods out there. We also aim to provide an interactive platform that will get more people and businesses talking about these issues, as well as discussing the big picture. So we want renewable energy like OTEC to one day replace fossil fuels to supply all our energy needs. Uh, I would say the easiest way to summarize OTEC um, and the ancillary technologies that come with it is basically because 85% of the sun's solar energy is stored in the uh, surface waters of the oceans, particularly the tropical oceans, OTEC is a way of tapping into the temperature differential. OTEC, or ocean thermal energy conversion, taps into the te temperature differential between the warm surface water uh, and the cold deep water that's just about 3,000 feet down and uses that temperature differential to produce clean base load electricity uh, without the use of fossil fuels and the ancillary industries of OTEC can also be used to uh, produce fresh potable drinkable water as well as uh, sustainable aquaculture and uh, mariculture or fish farm. So you have clean energy, fresh drinking water and sustainable food production that all can be wrapped up with the uh, OTEC process. Originally, for a couple of decades plus, I was a uh, trial lawyer and was uh, fortunate to have a very successful run at that. And then uh, a few years ago, um, a friend of mine and I started a uh, venture fund for all humanitarian sustainable investments. And of course, when we came across this technology in a company that was uh, trying to move it forward, it was a perfect fit because on the sustainability side, it's clean energy renewable and on the humanitarian side it's fresh drinking water and sustainable food production so it that's how I got involved in this originally was through our venture fund but we are uh, we were also not passive but active investors so we get in and help the company get where it needs it needs to go uh, yeah I've always been concern about uh, climate change, especially as it has become more and more um, accepted. And here in the U.S., as, as I mentioned when we were chatting yeah, off camera, yeah. the U.S. military now has come out in a very public way and said that uh, climate change is a fact. In fact, the, ocean, the Navy's top oceanographer is on record as saying climate change isn't coming, it's here, and we have to deal with it as the military. So. Um, that's a pretty strong statement from a credible source that this is something we, we have to deal with. Uh, and really, in a lot of ways to us, it's a, uh, it's a moral imperative, as the old adage goes, if not us, who? If not now, when? So that's the way we, we look at it. I would say the common thread among almost everything I do day in, day out is about communicating and educating uh, all kinds of people about OTEC, that it is now here and that it is ripe for immediate commercialization and that it truly is, as uh, our chairman Jeremy Feekins uh, describes it, a global game changer. Uh, so uh, that's what I do day in, day out, is, is educate people and, and communicate with folks like you and your audience. It really is knowing that, that we're, we're helping um, and helping especially future generations, you know, who aren't, aren't here today to, uh, to speak for themselves. This is about all of us helping our grandkids and their grandkids to have a world that's more sustainable and cleaner and where more places around the world have clean energy, fresh drinking water, and, and, uh, and food. That's good for everyone. We can use it extensively. The uh, estimates, and, and by the way, all of the other uh, sources of power that you mentioned, the renewables, those are great, and we're, well, you know, it's going to be a mix that ultimately gets us where we need to go. But the thing about OTEC that is so exciting is that it is baseload 24 7, 
as in contrast with some of the intermittent, uh, uh, say solar, um, which obviously is only going to work when the sun's shining or when when the wind's blowing. So uh, OTEC is unique in that in that sense, but it uh, has the potential to provide vast amounts of energy for large areas around the world. Uh, we're talking about right now 100 countries have been identified where the um, conditions for OTEC appear to be ideal. Um, you know, it's hard to quantify exactly in terawatts ultimately what that will be, but once we move from land-based OTEC plants to sea-based, and then, as the National Renewable Energy Laboratory says, ultimately, its greatest potential is hydrogen production, which can be a transportable fuel. So, I, I mean, I would say this, if, just to, uh, if you want to capture how vast this energy source is, what is stored in the ocean's uh, surface waters, then just consider for a moment, the best example I've ever uh, seen was the example of Hurricane Katrina in 2005, which of course devastated the Gulf Coast here in the States. When the hurricane passed over the open Gulf Coast, it drew up all of that heat, that warm water, which is where hurricane gets its energy. In doing so, it decreased the temperature of the surface water by a degree or two, uh, and then of course expended all that energy in, uh, you know, causing all that damage. All that energy that Hurricane Katrina expended would have been enough energy to meet all of the energy needs of the U.S. for an entire year, uh, plus some more. And after Hurricane Katrina expended that quantity of energy from drawing heat out of the surface water, it only took the sun a few days to heat the water back up mm -hmm. to replenish yeah. that lost energy. So it just gives you some idea of the vast quantity of energy we're tapping into. Uh, absolutely. I mean, many of those countries are in the on the list of the hundred places identified where we can do OTEC. We uh, actually have a, uh, a memorandum of understanding. In fact, in East Africa, to make uh, do multiple OTEC plants right now. Uh, and yes, it is. Uh, in a lot of these places that are paying exorbitant fees for electricity based on imported fossil fuels, OTEC competitive, particularly when you throw in the other uh, products uh, that can come with OTEC, they help make it even more economically feasible. So yes, a lot of these needy places are uh, great sites for OTEC, and it's already happening now. As I said, we're doing business in Africa now. Now, certainly from a technological perspective, we are at that point. OTEC is, is, a, is a proven technology, the original concept that goes back more than 100 years. 20 years ago, it was proven with the U.S. Department of Energy funding, again on the Big Island of Hawaii, with a land-based OTEC plant. Uh, our chief science officer was involved in that. There's been more than $300 million spent over time from various sources proving OTEC. And right now, we are in the process of commercializing it by building small land-based 5 to 10 megawatt OTEC plants that can be built with off-the-shelf components, which means there really is minimal to nil technology or engineering risk. So technologically, Nick, we're already mm -hmm. there. And now it has become economically feasible as well because in many of our markets, we're talking about places that are paying 40 to 60 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Mm -hmm. So OTEC can be provided to these places competitively and moreover, I think it's important to emphasize, it's not just a question of being able to have a competitive price today, particularly when you throw in the other ancillary industries, yeah. but also be able to give these communities a fixed price for 30 years so that they move away from the dependence on the volatility of oil. Because they are really, so many of our customers are so concerned now about where the price of oil is about to go. It's it, the oil is already killing their economies. They're paying so much of their annual GDP just to keep the lights on, and that is not sustainable. Uh, we're there now, and it's just going to accelerate at this point. OTEC, uh, with a land-based OTEC plant, you can use a portion of the electricity 
that you're deriving uh, from the ocean to also run a water des desalinization facility since you're bringing out millions of gallons of cold deep water anyway. So you can make uh, ancillary fresh potable water. Uh, and as they've done on the big island of Hawaii successfully, uh, you can also use that cold, deep, nutrient-rich ocean water for sustainable aquaculture and mariculture, which are types of fish farming. So you wrap all that together, and you're talking about clean energy, uh, fresh water, and food production for these communities, which is really a form of independence for them using local resources. The other one you touched on related to OTEC is seawater district cooling, which uh, in my layman's terms, as a non-scientist, I would describe as half an OTEC plant. An OTEC plant has a warm water pipe and a cold water pipe and uses the differential between the temperatures to make clean electricity. Seawater district cooling, on the other hand, is just a cold water pipe and you use the cold deep ocean water as the refrigerant to air condition very large structures, uh, which ultimately saves uh, 80 to 90 percent in electricity usage. Uh, so for large structures, as you can imagine, without the need for all these chillers, that um, saves the customer enormous sums of money, when in, in some cases can be hundreds of millions of dollars over the 20, 30 year period. And more important, the reduction in CO2 emissions that come with reducing the electricity uses that much is also uh, quite significant. Absolutely. We are beginning to see that movement now. In fact, we've had uh, discussions with one uh, major oil company as to actually using OTEC to provide the electricity for uh, an oil platform, which is quite ironic, but it, it makes sense rather than an oil producing platform to have to take crude oil, send it off to get refined, and then have it brought back out to run their platform. Uh, but yeah, I think that uh, some of the oil companies uh, who are really just exercising good business judgment mm -hmm. see where the is going and are taking notice of OTEC. And, and I just I would point out in response to your question that, uh, again, we are right now already doing uh, projects moving forward with land-based OTEC mm -hmm. plant. Uh, Sea-based, the floating, the, the platforms are the next step and that's coming in the not too distant future as well and uh, but yes I think the oil companies uh, uh, at least a significant portion of them see where things are going and uh, want to be part of that conversation and part of the market ultimately. Yeah we're involved in various other things we have um, in the Bahamas, we have a uh, signed uh, memorandum of understanding with the Bahamas Electricity Corporation to move forward with two land-based uh, OTEC plants there. Separate from that, we're involved in a project uh, in the Bahamas with the seawater district cooling facility. But we also have projects uh, ongoing in various stages in the, uh, as I mentioned, in Africa uh, and in the Pacific Ocean as well. So again, this really is um, has worldwide implications. And when you consider it, OTEC is ideal for the tropics because of the uh, heat of the surface water. Um, but when we're talking about the tropics, that's a wide geographic band where um, about 55% of the world's population lives. I think how widespread the support is for OTEC is reflected on our company's advisory board, which cuts across political ties. For instance, one of our advisory board members is uh, uh, Ed Rendell, the former uh, governor of Pennsylvania. Um, we also have uh, Congressman Carney, uh, Roy Bernardi, who was uh, uh, under President Bush, the uh, Secretary of HUD for a time. So we have Republicans and Democrats. Um, and again, that's our advisory board, but this is reflected more generally. This is not a, uh, what we're doing does not engender divisiveness at all. Quite to the contrary, um, obviously the environmental community, uh, some of the leaders in, the, in that community support OTEC. In fact, a former environmental defense fund executive is on our board. Uh, but you also have people in the national and international security community who see that 
OTEC can really help by reducing the global demand for oil, which helps keep the price down. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, obviously we all know, as former CIA director Jim Woolsey pointed out, oil money can really go to fund um, some, some, some downright uh, bad factions mm -hmm. in the world, and including some of these uh, schools that be basically teach uh, you know, bigotry and hatred and things like that of certain groups. So, um, and then, of course, a lot of people recognize, a lot of military leaders, we, you know, we've had these conversations, recognize as a matter of international security that whatever we can do to promote economic development in places in the world so that they have their own reliable energy, so that they have fresh water and food makes them more stable regions which, of course, uh, reduces the risk. It's stability around the world is good for international security. So to answer your question, we have all kinds of people who are OTEC proponents, and they cut across the political divide. It's, it's really... And then, of course, in the business community, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of business people understand that you know the next Google or Apple is likely to come out of the energy and water sector because... Whatever else you say, at the end of the day, the business world is about, you know, what are you selling and what is the demand for it? And in a, in a world where the population is growing exponentially and the world is industrializing, there's no question what the world needs now and will continue to need in ever-growing amounts is uh, plenty of energy, sustainable energy, and fresh drinking water. So that's why we have so much support and very, very few detractors, which I'm happy, happy to say. Uh, well, the world has always had its critics, and, and I would uh, suggest that uh, people at the leading edge of, uh, uh, you know, doing things that we need to do to change toward progress for the betterment have always been met with those critics. I mean, even uh, uh, the American President John F. Kennedy, when he said in 1961 that he committed to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, was met with some skepticism that that's not possible. Well. Well, did it, yeah. Done, and all these wonderful things came out of the space program for the whole world, technologically. So, and we're not talking here about conquering the moon. We're talking about, uh, if you will, conquering the ocean with a technology that's been proven. That's it's so it's so commonsensical that even a non-science guy like me gets it. You're tapping into the energy that's there. Um, so. Uh, we're really not concerned about the few critics that are out there. We, you know, we welcome all questions, and we just, as far as critics are concerned, you know, many of them that we encounter once they get up-to-date information on where OTEC is and why it's right now. And don't get me wrong, we're not saying OTEC is the panacea or that it's suited for the entire world. Clearly, there are places that it's not because the temperature uh, of the waters are not uh, the right uh, differential, or it may be for a land-based plant that the continental shelf in lots of areas uh, doesn't drop off quickly enough to just by building an OTEC plant, but, but there's no doubt that there are many regions around the world where it can be done. It can be done now technologically and economically to, uh, to the benefit of, of so many people, so that's exactly what we're doing.